There's no rhyme 
sacrifice to offer. There's no penance to complete. Freely drink the living water without money can empty. It is finished, he has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished. Raise a shout with ragged voice. And go bravely into battle, knowing he has won the war. It is finished, lift your head, let every sinner rejoice. Hear the dying victors cry, raise up your voice, sing it out through earth and sky. It is finished, he has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. And the mission is accomplished. Raise a shower of ragged voice. And go bravely into battle. Knowing he has won the war. It is finished, lift your head. Despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it on dark Calvary. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I cherish the old lovely cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old lovely cross and exchange it someday. I actually don't know how that sound is getting there. this morning. Uh, the first one, guess what? Rainier Valley Church made the newspaper. Hey, there we go. There's our smiling faces right there. So uh, if you're new with us or joining us online, uh, we have been doing over the, the, the summer, 
uh, something we're calling the Nehemiah 217 project. We studied through the book of Nehemiah. They rebuilt the wall and the city and the temple. They re-energized the people of God. And we said, you know what? Uh, coming out of COVID with a city that has been in large part just uh, destroyed, we need to get out there. We need to get out of our four, four walls of the church, take the love of God that we receive and know, and extend it to others. And so what we've been doing um, is once a month, we go out and uh, we paint walls, as we did right here at the, the Vietnamese newspaper. Um, we clean up graffiti and we pick up trash, and we just try to love our neighbors. And so if you haven't been a part of it, I want to encourage you. Our last work day for the Nehemiah 217 Project coming up on Sunday, August 15th, all right? All the cleaning supplies are provided, and we'd love to have you join us. What we do is we have our regular worship service, and then afterwards we do lunch, and uh, the folks that are leading the teams will kind of explain where we're going. We're usually right around the church in this neighborhood. And we go and we'll uh, maybe paint a, a storefront that has been vandalized and graffitied and, and messed up. And we just want to love and, and serve our neighbors. So if you haven't been a part of it, I encourage you to be a part of it. If you have been a part of it, uh, remember that it's coming up our last Sunday uh, in the summer, August 15th. And... Um, Part of our August 15th that I wanted to also let you know about, I'm very excited, is that uh, we're going to be having uh, a guest speaker on August 15th, our very own Ken Sabalza, will be bringing the word. And we're also really excited because on August 15th, um, we're going to have a guest musician who's going to be leading us in worship. Some of you might remember this guy, Nate Porter. So the Porter family is going to be back in town and leading us in worship, and uh, they're going to bring some friends as well. So if you can make it on August 15th, it is going to be a wonderful day full of uh, some great worship and time together and then serving our community. Uh, a couple other things I want to let you know. So we just entered into August. It's already August, everyone. Welcome. I know it happened real, real quick. Um, and I'm trying to sort of give you a sense of what the church is going to be up to in August, and so we got our Nehemiah project, we got a guest speaker, guest musician. We're also going to be doing a kids training on Sunday, August 22nd. And so our goal is the first Sunday of September to, uh, to restart and relaunch our kids ministry. And so here is the ask for all of you. We're looking for uh, four different roles, four different volunteer roles, um, and administrative support that can coordinate everyone. We're looking for welcome and check-in. You can greet families, connect with kids, get everyone signed in and checked in well. And then we're also looking for teachers who can open the word of God and explain it to our kids. We'll have the material, the curriculum, but you get to embody um, wh what the Christian life is to these kids. And I, I don't know about you, but if you grew up in the church like I did, I still have very fond memories of my, <laughs> my um, uh, Sunday school teacher. She was an incredible woman. Um, and then also uh, in the nursery. So we want to just pr provide an option for those with small kiddos. And so we'd love for some folks that would be willing. Uh, everyone who serves needs a background check, but willing to, to hold some babies. And um, just to encourage you as well, uh, this is a great opportunity. We're talking about loving and serving. Uh, Nehemiah 217, we're going out um, into our neighborhood. And uh, in this, we get to serve our church body. And there's a few families that watch uh, every Sunday online and are waiting until we are able to open up our children's ministry. And so uh, you'll, you'll find that even here this morning, um, we will probably uh, maybe double, I don't know, we'll grow a little bit um, in September when we're able to relaunch our children's ministry and serve a lot of our families. By the way, hi families who are joining us uh, from your living rooms and so on. Good to have you with us. All right, so that is what's going on as we continue this week. We're also, for those of you who are new, we're continuing to read through the New Testament together as a church family. And so our reading plan is called Same Page Summer because we're on the exact same page of the Bible, reading it together. We just made it through Romans, which was quite the read. And this week, we're going into the book of 1 Corinthians. You want to talk about a crazy read. Spiritual gifts, singleness, marriage, divorce, all sorts of craziness. The church is a mess, and there's a lot of practical uh, teaching and help. So... If you don't have one already, I encourage you to pick up one of these little handy-dandy um, you know, uh, reading plans. You can mark off the Sundays. We also, um, if you are following us on any of our online accounts, we're linked up with what's called YouVersion. And you can read through the Bible on YouVersion. 
And so, uh, and there's also a bunch of us from the church in that group, and so we leave little comments and stuff, and it's a great practical encouragement. And I'll just share this too. Some of you might be like, man, you know, it's been a crazy summer. I haven't done super well. And here's what I would tell you. Um, it's not about checking every box. It's just about being in the word. You have to eat every day. You have to eat spiritual food. It nourishes your soul. And so don't feel like, oh, I haven't been a part of this, or maybe I'm new. And I, you know, I, I just pick it up. Start going through the word. Practice that regular spiritual discipline. Your dentist tells you to floss. Your pastor tells you to read the Bible, all right? And I'm going to keep doing it. So get in the word. And speaking about the word, um, our kids' candy bar, our king-size candy bar challenge, man, it's hard to say, is, uh, is coming up. We have the last month, the last month, kiddos. So you're going through 1 Peter and Mark. And uh, the goal is to get this all checked off. And then at our baptism and barbecue, you bring this to me, and I give you a gigantic king-size candy bar. And, and you might think, well, okay, I'm super into that, but why the king-size candy bar? Because God's word is a treat. God's word is good. And so as you eat that candy bar, uh, the whole point, the candy bar will be gone in a minute or two, and it'll be amazing, right? But God's word goes deep into your heart, and it nourishes you for a lifetime. And so we want all of our, our, all of our kids um, and so on to, to re be reading through the Bible. And we're excited about doing our baptism barbecue, which is the last announcement. Thanks for sticking with us. So at the end of summer, we're doing a big baptism and barbecue uh, celebration. This is on Sunday, August 29th. Um, and just a reminder, we're meeting outdoors at Seahurst Park. That's down in Burien, all right? It's about eh, 25 minutes away from here. And so uh, we will not be meeting here. So if you show up here on August 29th, uh, no one's going to be here. All right. So make a note, <laughs> make a note of that. Um, uh, three things I want to let you know about the baptism barbecue. The first is if you're interested in being baptized, um, I, please come talk with me. We would love to be able to baptize you, celebrate your faith um, and walk alongside you for as long as God would have you in Seattle. And so come talk with me. Also, I just want to uh, throw this out there as well to maybe even some of the parents that are watching online. Um, it's never too early to begin conversations with your kids about baptism. So if they've never been baptized and they have a genuine faith and they want to love Jesus, let's go ahead and baptize them. And so I uh, want to encourage you to think that over. Um, so if you're interested in baptisms, let me know. Uh, the other thing is it, I need a couple of folks who are interested and helping drive. So we did this um, at Easter. We had two different folks with a van or some kind of large vehicle. And they typically, uh, what they did was they met in the parking lot here at around 9.30. So folks who don't have a ride that take the train or come over from Hope Place or whatever it is, they can hop in a car and then go to our outdoor service. So if you're interested in helping drive people, let me know. I need probably two cars that can meet here at 9.30. So we'll have uh, six to eight open spots for folks who want to carpool down or need to carpool down there. And if you need to carpool as well, ask me. Okay, one last thing on that is uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. We're going to sing together. We're going to do baptisms out in the water. We're going to take communion on the beach together. Some of these folks being baptized will, be, will take communion for the first time. My little girl Izzy is looking at getting baptized. I'm going to be a mess just crying the whole time, so bear with me. But it's going to be really sweet. And then after all of this, we're just going to have a barbecue and eat together, fellowship together. And so I need a couple of folks who are willing uh, to basically work the grills. We're going to have uh, burgers and dogs and such. And then we're going to ask folks to bring um, some kind of appetizer or side dish or uh, beverage. And we'll go over all the details as we get closer. But if you're interested in helping to barbecue, let me know. Okay. Okay. That is all the announcements. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me there. That's our August. We're really looking forward to it. I want to go ahead and invite John up. John, if you want to come on up, brother, uh, to read the scripture for us. I think we have. Let me turn this off. Check, check, check. Yeah, there we go. And uh, actually have the scripture. On, oh, and you got a Bible too. Perfect. All right. said so here we go oh can you all hear me now all right they 
big height difference between John and Jason here. With <laughs> uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sweet. Awesome, okay. <clears throat> For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, for the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he weighed down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and we assure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Amen. Thank you, John. All right. Uh, as we get into the word today, let's go ahead and ask for the Lord's help and guidance. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. Uh, for those who are here and those who are joining us online, Lord, we pray that you would refine us, challenge us, change us, shape us, grow us, conform us into the image of Jesus. Lord, we recognize that you are here this morning and you are not silent. You speak through your word. The ultimate miracle is happening right now. The same voice that spoke the universe into being is now speaking life into our hearts. May we be teachable, receptive, willing to receive. Lord, forgive us for any ways that our pride would say this is about someone else or just tune out or think that something else is more important. Father, we want to know you, love you, and follow after you. We want to model our lives after Jesus. We want to look more like him. So, God, we pray that you would do your good work in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. All God's people say amen. 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 All right. Well, we're continuing on in our Knowing You Know God series. We've been looking through the book of 1 John this summer. And it's been really interesting because... Um, there, there's all sorts of stuff that just doesn't feel like, mm, that's maybe not the way I would explain it. And one of the things that we talked about is the way that John, um, who is an apostle, basically Jesus' best friend, the only surviving of the 12 disciples still left, writing this letter, the way he describes God is very interesting to us, right? So when you think about God, you might think, oh yeah, he's all powerful or he rules the universe. And John in this book uses two descriptions of God that really frame the book. The first is he says, God is light. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And then he unpacks what that means, and he says that we are to walk in the light. We're to be honest with one another, and when we're doing that, we can have assurance that we're forgiven and we're loved by God. So God is light is one section. We're now in the second section of the book, which says that God is love. God is love. And because God loves us, we are to love others. And what's interesting is that I've gotten some good feedback so far as we've been going through 1 John. One of the things that makes, I think, each and every one of us just a little bit nervous is that John speaks in these stark contrasts, right? He talks about life and death. He talks about love and hatred. And you're like, whoa, John, calm down, dude. Come to Seattle. Let us show you the, the middle ground, the third way, right? Chill out. Look at some of these different uh, explanations. We walk in the light. Oh, uh, yeah, the, uh, they, us, Antichrist, Christ, those who love the world, those who love the Father. Um, and throughout, he just contrasts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so today we're going to look at something um, that at first might seem like this doesn't apply to us, this doesn't even work. And what John is going to contrast is he's going to talk about how we are to love others. 
And he's going to contrast this by saying, you either love others or you hate others. And before you go, I get it, love. It's on all the yard signs. It's everywhere. I'm pro-love, right? This, you know, done. I get it, right? And hatred, I don't hate anybody, right? I live in Seattle, man. Peace and love, right? Like, it's all good. Let's let the scripture do its work in our hearts and in our minds. And so um, we're going to look at a couple of things this morning. Uh, sort of the, the big idea is that we want to love others as Jesus has loved us. We want to love others as Jesus has loved us. And so um, our, our points as we work through this text is that the, uh, we're commanded to love one another. So we do this because God loved us, because God commanded us to. This is our motivation, our duty. Um, and then we're going to look at, so okay, everyone's you know, big into love, but what does that mean? We're going to look at two examples that John gives, right? John is going to look at the example of Cain. Example of Cain. So if you remember your Sunday school, if you grew up in church, Cain and Abel. We're going to look at that story. Then he's going to, so Cain is the negative example of love. <laughs> then he's going to look at Christ, who's the positive example of love. And then, and then he's going to explore real quick, um, in conclusion, the privileges of loving one another. When we actually love one another, there are blessings that flow from that. And so that's where we're going this morning. The first, we're going to look at the command. So um, verse 11 of chapter 3, it says this, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is Christianity 101. This is the foundation. This is the very basic um, we talked about this b letter being written by Grandpa Pastor John, right? This is a guy in his 90s who was Jesus' best friend. And as he reflects back on Jesus' ministry, you know, the miracles, the teaching, the resurrection, the ascension, all this incredible stuff. He says, you know what matters most? That we love one another. That we love one another. Perhaps the greatest miracle, even <laughs> beyond the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins, and Christ dying on the cross is that he brought his spirit so that all the hatred and animosity and division, that we would love one another, that he's creating a new family. And so it's a, a beautiful to me. There's a, um, a fourth century theologian, his name was Jerome, and he tells a story about Grandpa Pastor John, uh, the Apostle John, that when he was very old and frail, and we know that he wrote this in his 90s, um, that he, he was unable to walk, so his disciples would carry him into church gatherings. And um, every week, he would say these words to the congregation, little children love one another. Little children love one another. And this went on week after week after week until at last one, uh, <laughs> more than one of uh, the disciples was a little weary of these repeated phrases from the man who lived with Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who camped with Jesus, who talked with Jesus. And so uh, the story goes from Jerome that one of the disciples of John asked him and said, Master, why do you always say this? And uh, the story goes famously, John replied, because it is the Lord's command. And if this only is done, it is enough. If this only is done, it is enough. Jesus was approached by um, a young man who asked him, uh, how do I get, to, uh, or how can I enter the kingdom of God? And he said, uh, you know, what, what does the Bible say? And he's like, oh, the Ten Commandments, and I've done those things. And uh, Jesus says, basically in, in summarizing the, the entire Bible, he says that we are to love God and love others. That's the whole summation of the Bible. And some of you might be thinking, oh, my goodness, really loving others? Like, this is so basic. This is so simple. This almost seems kind of ridiculous, right? I went, uh, some of you went to college. Some of you are even PhDs. They're like, love one another. Is there anything more basic? Is there anything more foundational? Is there anything more bedrock to the Christian faith than loving others? And I would also argue, is there anything more complicated? Is there anything more difficult? Is there anything more challenging and vexing than loving one another? Uh, here's a great summertime illustration when Jesus says, hey, the whole Bible is about loving God and loving others, um, it's a little bit like uh, a pool. Um, on the, the this is again, simple illustration, bear with me here, but on one side is the shallow end, and kids can wade into it and splash around and have fun. On the other side, uh, adults can dive into the pool. What does it mean that we love one another? 
It has all the simplicity that we can t teach this to our kids and all the complexity that the, the, the greatest theologians of all his history have contemplated this. I love the way uh, St. Augustine says it. The Bible was composed in such a way that as beginners mature, its meaning grows with them. What do you hear when you hear that we should love one another? I hope the meaning has grown as you have grown in your faith. Love each other, that's great. I'm pro-love. What does that mean? What does that mean? Let's let that meaning grow. So Grandpa Pastor John is reflecting on Genesis chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. And he's going to use this as an illustration. He's going to give us the negative and the positive example of what it means to love one another. First, we start with the negative example. I'm sorry to ruin your nice morning, but we're going to talk about murder. Dun, dun, dun. So here's the negative example. Verse 12. We should not be like Cain. Got it. All right. Who was of the evil one. He's on a different team. He's partnering with Satan. He murdered his brother. How do we know he's on a different team? Because he killed his own brother. And why did he murder him? Why? So let's go back real quick. Many of you might be familiar with this story. Adam and Eve uh, sin against God and are banished from the garden, right? They begin to have kids, and we focus the story in on Cain and Abel. It says that uh, Cain was a, a worker of the field. He's a gardener, if you will. Abel was a keeper of flocks. He's a shepherd, cowboy, whatever. And it says, in the course of time, they went to, uh, to make an offering to the Lord. And so Abra or, uh, Abel rather brings the, the first of his flocks. He offers a sacrifice of a lamb. And Cain brings the first of his, the fruits of the ground. And so what, what I want us to see here, like we can read this very simply and be like, all right, don't murder. I get it, right? But I want, I want the story to kind of push into your heart a little bit. Think about this for a moment. Cain was not an atheist. He was a worshiper. Cain wasn't even a consumer. He brought a sacrifice. Both Cain and Abel show up for church. Both Cain and Abel came with an offering. Both Cain and Abel came on the same day. Both Cain and Abel came with hands full. Both Cain and Abel came to the same place. There is nothing wrong with what they brought in their hands. People will often say, oh, the reason that God accepted uh, Abel and rejected Cain was because Abel brought a meat sacrifice and Cain brought a vegetable sacrifice. He brought some green beans or something, right? Some fruit. Um, and what's interesting, though, is I want to make the argument that there was nothing wrong with what they brought in their hands. The problem is what they brought in their hearts. Cain is comparing himself to Abel, and he's thinking, I bet my offering is worth way more than Abel's. Cain is thinking, Abel's lifting his hands and singing and trying to act all holy, but I know it's just an act. I mean, I can be... I could be that passionate about God if my life was as blessed as Abel's. Cain is thinking, oh man, Abel's outfit, that must have cost him a fortune. Look how humble I am. But imagine how much I could engage God and love him if I could just have nice clothes. Cain looks like he's worshiping. On the outside, it looks like everything is fine. But on the inside, he is seething with jealousy. And so the question is, if we are to not be like Cain, I want to ask us to honestly reflect on this this morning. Are you like Cain this morning? You might be here and you might be worshiping and you might look fine on the outside, but on the inside you are comparing yourselves to others and you are seething with jealousy. Maybe it's not someone in the room. Maybe it's a family member or a friend or a coworker. But jealousy is is the defining mark of your relationship towards them and your view of them. Your friend gets married and you still have no prospects and you seem to only be getting older. Your to coworker gets paid three times as much because they're more senior than you, but they're lazy and entitled and you work twice as hard as they do. Your friends start having babies, but you have health complications and you're not able to conceive. People around you are all aging and they're healthy but you seem to be constantly getting sick and your body is falling apart. People are, um, you are moved to a new area. You come to church, maybe even here, and all of a sudden you seem like, man, everyone else is really connected and knows each other, and I feel so outside. I feel so lonely, and I am jealous of the relationships I see other people have. 
your whole social circle has already retired and they're enjoying grandkids and vacations and you're still having to work. And there is jealousy in your relationship towards them. You stay up all night studying as hard as you can to take a test. You only get mediocre grades. And your friend who doesn't study at all but plays Fortnite the whole time does better than you. How is this fair? Ugh. Jealousy is why you just don't like certain people. Jealousy is the, is the foundational truth of why you just don't want to be around some certain people. And lest we think, don't be like Cain because he was a murderer. Well, I don't murder anyone. What Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is he takes every prohibition, every commandment in the Ten Commandments, and he applies it even deeper in the heart. He says to hate someone is the same as murdering them. Because hate is the root and murder is the ultimate fruit. I don't hate someone. But if you are jealous and that jealousy then lapses into bitterness, then you will find yourself saying something along the lines of, I wish that person weren't here. I don't want that person in my life. I wish they didn't even exist. And what is that but internalized, imaginary murder? Jealousy is like acid, battery acid to our hearts and to our faith. And it will just eat away at us. And we can look like Cain and we can come to church and carry our Bibles and raise our hands and sing our songs and give our money and take communion and laugh with other people and say everything is fine. But that does not exempt us from jealousy. Jesus said that we are to love God and love others. And the truth is we do not love others when we look at them with envy and jealousy in our hearts. Everyone else becomes our competition instead of our family. And notice the big thing that's missing in all this. Where's our focus? It's not on God. It's on other people. So murder is the outward act of inward hate. Murder is the fruit, and anger and jealousy is the root. Cain hates his own brother, and all of this begins with a little seed of jealousy. We need to be very careful as Christians because oftentimes we can make the mistake of saying, oh, it's the big sins. You know, it's the, the, the sexual sins. It's the murder, the, the theft, the stealing, right? Those are the big sins. But things like jealousy, that's fine, right? It's a, a little bit like I grew up in Hawaii. And uh, when we would go out and play on the beach, they'd always warn us about sharks, right? You got to be careful about sharks, right? But what they forgot to warn you about was the stinging jellyfish, and so as a kid, you're like, ah, ha, ha, look at this thing. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to poke it. I'm going to, ah, ha, ha, ha. And what I don't want to do um, is make that same mistake in a spiritual way. I don't want you to be thinking, well, look it. I didn't go riot last summer, and I didn't burn anything down, and I'm a generally good person. But are, when you log on to your social media, do you find that you are just seething with jealousy, that you are just so jealous towards what other people have. Instead of rejoicing with them, you wish you had what they have. You wish they didn't get what they got. You wish that they weren't even around. We ought to be very careful. Murder is only the ultimate outworking of jealousy, bitterness, and hatred. Let us not play with those things that we are to put to death. And what's interesting is Grandpa Pastor John, is re he's reflecting on the example of Cain. He has another, so he says, don't be like Cain. He murdered his brother. He's of the evil one. And if you remember the story of Cain and Abel, uh, Cain's sacrifice is rejected, and God comes to him. And he says, hey, Cain, if you do what's right, w will you not be accepted? But then he has a warning. He says, Cain, Cain sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you, to have the, the Hebrew in that is it's like an apex predator that's just going to consume him. It's going to eat him alive. And God warns him. He says it will master you. You must rule over it. You must rule over it. So if you are like, man, I do have jealousy in my heart. What does it look like to rule over it? Confess it. Admit it. Confess it. Give it to the Lord. And the best way that you can kill the jealousy that you feel to others is celebrate what God has done in their life. 
celebrate it. If you can genuinely praise God for the blessings that others are experiencing, not only will you be unified with them, not only will sin be removed so you can be connected to God, but you will be more happy, more joyful, less angry, less anxious, less bitter, less frustrated. And so what's interesting is Grandpa Pastor John has another Um, kind of takeaway from the story of Cain and Abel. In verse 13, he says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Meaning this, he looks at the story of Cain and Abel. He sees, okay, so Eve believed the serpent um, and they were banished from the garden. And then God said, there's going to be enmity. There's going to be war. There's going to be the people of God and the people of Satan. When Cain starts to experience jealousy, he's got an option. Which team are you going to play for? And those of you who know the story know that What ends up happening is that Cain calls Abel out into the field. He rises up and he murders his own brother. He kills his own brother. And the example that John wants to pull from this is he says, don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Not only should we not be like Cain and be careful of the jealousy in our own heart, but we should also be like Abel and be ready for the Cain's in our life to rise up and want to destroy us. And I know this is really, really hard and not super necessarily like, oh yeah, okay, that's you know, Christian appropriate. But I, I just have to tell you, especially if you're a younger Christian, do not be surprised if the world hates you. Cain hated Abel, the world hated Jesus. Someone might hate you, are you okay with that? And what the the problem is, a lot of Christians want nothing more than to be liked, want nothing more than everyone around them to think well of them, to highly esteem them, to say that they're a good person. And the problem with our ever-changing culture is that if Christians want to go that way, they will then privatize their faith, they will modify their beliefs, they will change their language, they will cut out parts of the Bible, they will change God's very character so that the world will love them. Please love me, accept me, come to my church, be my friend, think highly of me. Do not be surprised, surprised, Grandpa Pastor John says, that the world hates you. There will come a test in everyone's life. If you're a new Christian here, you're watching us online, I warn you, this is coming, if it hasn't already. It's It's not if, it's when. There will come a test in everyone's life. What matters most to me? The approval of people or the approval of God? The smile of people or the smile of God? We are to love God and love others. And by this, look what uh, Grandpa Pastor John says in verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life, out of spiritual death, out of the domain of darkness, out of the um, control of the evil one. We've passed out of death into life, eternal life, life of the spirit, life with God. And what's the mark of this? Is it because I raised my hand? Is it because I prayed a prayer? Is it because, you know, I nailed something to the cross at church summer camp or, or whatever? He says, here's the, we know, we can know because we love the brothers, because we love the brothers. Grandpa Pastor John looks at the story of Cain and Abel and he says, you know what? That's for Christians. And you know what? Christians can have assurance when we actually love other Christians. It's a supernatural work of God. I I don't know about you, but I've experienced this in my own life. Uh, Many of you have heard my story. When I was um, a, a young adult, I was like a really angry atheist, but I was basically just a bitter, disenfranchised church kid that, you know, had... (laughs) had some bad experiences. And so I didn't read the books and I didn't know the arguments, but I was really, really mad. And I remember getting invited by some friends to a college group and uh, it was so immature. You know, they were spelling joy out with their bodies and they were like bobbing for apples and doing all these ridiculous games. I'm like, and I'm, you know, I'm just seething. I'm like, how can a good God allow evil and cancer and death, right? And so you know, they all get together and they do this little Bible study for like five minutes. And they're like, does anyone have any questions? I'm like, get out of me here. Why this and that? And, uh, and you know, I just, and I, um, what was interesting, just to shorten this story, is that like they love me and they answer my questions and they invited me out for breakfast and lunch and dinner and walk with me over years. And for me, one of the big signs, like, wow, God had changed my heart. 
it wasn't a, a light from heaven, but it was a light from heaven in my heart because what happened was I was meeting with these folks and they said, hey, what if we took the next 40 days, uh, we were all you know, doing uh, work in and going to school, and they said, what if after our jobs, we all got together at a friend's apartment and we just spent the time praying and singing together? I'm like, yes, let's do that. Did I just say that? <laughs> when did I change? When did I start loving these weirdos? <laughs> the mark of God. Our affections change, our desires change, our community changes. And Grandpa Pastor Chan says, you know you've made this change when you genuinely love other Christians. And then he says, whoever does not love abides in death. And let's let this challenge us real quick. Again, we're not Cain. We don't murder but Grandpa Pastor John is saying, you know when the Spirit's in your heart, when you genuinely want to know and seek the best for other Christians around you. If you don't care, if you are trying to avoid, if you could care less about others, you need to check your heart. Because as we walk in the light and as we receive the God who is love, we begin to love others. We begin to care about others. Jealousy, contempt, bitterness, and envy should have no place in a Christian's heart. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That seed of wishing they didn't exist is in our hearts if we hate our brother. You know that no murderer has eternal life. We, it's, it's hard for me. It is so hard for me, honestly, guys, I'll, I'll say this. <laughs> My wife said, don't use the pulpit as a personal confessional or to make rants. And so I want to teach the word, and I'm not going to rant here. But I will just say this. As your pastor, it is so heartbreaking to pray and work over these scriptures and to feel sometimes like it is just a, you know, a bullet ricocheting off a hard heart. It utterly breaks my heart. This is not just ideas. This is truth. This is not just concepts. This is a living reality. This isn't just God in ethereal, mm, that makes me feel good. This is the living king who rules and reigns over all creation, who is building his kingdom. We cannot hide. We cannot play games. We cannot make excuses. We cannot justify or minimize or blame shift. I hear people all the time say, well, it's not bitterness. Here, here's what I really want to rid us of. It is okay to sin. Because we are going to. That's why Jesus came to die for us. Rather acknowledge, confess, repent, and be cleansed. Because the world doesn't know what to do with sin. So the world has to by virtue. Uh, uh, it's excusable. I have my little community. I'm going to celebrate it. It's somebody else's fault. It's this person. It's that person. Christians have the resources because Jesus died on the cross that we can be honest because my identity is not in my performance and what Jesus did for me. So I can fully admit when I'm wrong. How do you know you're growing in your Christian faith when you feel like you're not growing because you're more aware of your sin? Because you have to confess more often. Because you recognize where you're falling short. Because you are truly loving one another. What does it mean to love one another? <laughs> I have uh, some friends, um, uh, a young guy in particular was part of my ministry uh, when we were down in Portland, and um, he worked at a Baskin Robbins, and he was studying um, computer science. He ends up getting hired by this like banking firm or something in uh, Silicon Valley, you know, down in San Francisco area, and ends up making like a gazillion dollars, right? And uh, anyways, so he's been really into the tech industry. And one of the things uh, that he was <laughs> telling me about is that a big thing in San Francisco, at least before COVID and everything, was uh, this idea of self-driving cars, right? Many of you are familiar with this. You've seen this. The problem with self-driving cars is that um, the programmers have to make some decisions, some moral decisions, right? And so I was talking with this guy, and one of the things that you brought up that I never even thought of, because I'm like, I'm pro, or at least was, pro self-driving car, sign me up, nobody knows how to drive anymore, let the computer do it, yes, <laughs> sure, right? And uh, he was saying, okay, but here's the problem. What if an accident is unavoidable? What if an accident is unavoidable? He said that there was a, uh, one of the tech companies, everyone's designing their own self-driving car, they sent out a survey. <laughs> And they literally ask this question. They say, in an unavoidable accident, when uh, the driver must you know, basically either 
uh, sacrifice himself or uh, someone else, who should be sacrificed? Who should be sacrificed? And almost 100% said, the driver. The driver should be sacrificed. And so then the next question on the survey was, how many of you would be willing to drive in a self-driving car like this? And then 100% said, no way. Not me. I think the driver should be sacrificed, but not if I'm in the car. No thanks. And what's interesting, brace yourselves for this, but as Christians, we are the recipients of a self-sacrificing love that we are to receive and then to embody. By this, we know love. Here's the positive example. It's the example of Jesus. What does love mean? We see it everywhere. It is, it is the most overused word in the English language. By this, we know love that he laid down his life for us. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. How do I know that God loves me? Uh, you know, I have people, as a pastor, I have people come to me all the time saying, if I could only be assured of God's love, if he would give me a dream, if he would do a miracle, if he would write my name in the sky, then I could believe. And evidently, in God's mercy, in his knowledge, he has given us the greatest sign. While we're, you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. What does love look like? Look to the cross. Self-sacrificial love. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. And he gave it to us anyway. It is such a beautiful example of the love of God. And here's the thing. It's an example that we are called to embody. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. When you think about church and you think about Christian community, right? Maybe, maybe it's a good feeling. Maybe it's a bad feeling. Maybe it's no feeling. Here's what I want to encourage us. Grandpa Pastor John in his 90s is saying that same love. I saw Jesus dying on the cross. That type of self-sacrifice is what should mark our relationships with one another. We should embody this because when we truly experience love, it changes us. There's a story of a family that went to New York City and they were walking around and they were going to all the tourist spots and the dad suddenly killed over having a heart attack. As the story goes, a stranger, the crowd you know, formed up and a stranger jumped out of the crowd, uh, apparently with some medical background, a doctor of some sort, and he helped the dad. And as medical professionals were coming in, the stranger just kind of faded back into the crowd. Turns out that the medical help that he provided to the father who had a heart attack actually ended up saving the guy's life. And so the story went that the family was so moved by this random stranger and his sacrificial love that they tried to find him just to thank him. So they sent out all of these press releases and they just wanted to know who this person was. It's a beautiful story because the truth is when we experience real, genuine, sacrificial love, it changes us. In the same way they're looking to honor, to thank, to repay, to respond to this guy. When we understand Jesus died for my lying and my lust and my greed and my selfishness, I want to live differently. I want to extend that love to others. I want to live out the example he's given me. And so how do we do this? What does this look like? Here's the challenge, verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods, do you have the world's goods? Do you have more than food and clothes? Do you have a storage shed? Do you have extra storage? Do you have a garage? Do you have a closet? Do you have a bank account? If anyone has the world's goods, that's all of us. Check, sign me up. And sees his brother in need. Are there needs around us? Overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly. If you're like me, you open your phone, and it's just, it's so overwhelming. I, I, was, I was just looking through, scrolling, and I was seeing the amount of deaths, of COVID deaths in Indonesia, protests for democracy in Cuba, riots after the assassination of the Haitian president, uh, suppression of free, free speech in Hong Kong. And, and then I think about our family. Guys, I love this church so much, but as you get to know folks, 
there is so much pain. There's so much brokenness. There's so much heartache. There's so much wrestling. There's so much struggling. And it can be overwhelming. And so what I want to encourage us against is uh, something that folks are calling compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue. Because what tends to happen is we have the world's goods and we see people in need because whenever we open our phone, there's a thousand needs. For the first time in all of human history, I can know what somebody is suffering from all the way on the other side of the world instantaneously. And it's overwhelming. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? If you have seen that Jesus died for you, sacrificing his very life, he didn't deserve it. If there was anyone that was perfect, if there was anyone that was truly a victim, if there was any true injustice in this world, it was when Jesus went to the cross. But he did it for us. And John is saying, if we can't even open our wallet or our schedule or our heart to love others, then we don't get it. Then we don't get it. Yet he closes his heart. Yet he closes his heart. The, um, the Greek word for heart is like your insides. You're locking up your insides. I'm refusing to feel that. I'm refusing to let that bother me. I'm refusing to enter into truly love someone. Here's the truth about Christian community. We are called to rejoice with those who rejoice. And we're called to mourn with those who mourn. And here is the truth. We live in a culture, I need you to hear this, this is going to get me in trouble, but I need you to hear this. We live in a culture that prioritizes survival over self-sacrifice. It's all about us and maintaining what we need and our self-care and our love and setting our life up so that we feel fulfilled, whereas Christian love is about emptying ourselves for the good of others. Now, I know there's like maybe 2% of you that you're all this and you don't obey the commandment to Sabbath, and you don't uh, um, receive God's love, and you're just pouring yourself out. But by and large, our culture is shaping us to be like this. It's about me and my survival, and I'm number one, and everyone else, if they add to it, great. If they don't, forget it. And what, what Grandpa Pastor John is saying is we follow the example of Christ who gave himself for us. We should give ourselves for others. We should not be content when there are those who are suffering and hurting and there's great need, and you might think, okay, but compassion fatigue. Pastor Kyle, I'm overwhelmed. There's so much going on. So here's what I would tell you. What is right in front of your face? Right? Kiddos, are you obeying your parents? Are you actually loving your siblings? Are you quick to confess your sin, to pick up the messes that are created as life gets, gets tough? As we, you know, Scratch against each other. Uh, married folks, are you living in unity and fellowship with one another? Or have you fallen out of fellowship and it's just too painful and too awkward to get back into it? And so you're just going to kind of let things go and maybe time will make it better. We ought not to have the world's goods and close our heart. Practically, this, uh, you know, I, I gave a long list of, of ways that you can serve the church. There are, there's, we're doing kids ministry that's starting up. We've got all sorts of things going on. If you have gifts, if you have talents, we have needs. We have needs. And so, <laughs> Grandpa Pastor John, here he goes. Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. You know, when you're as old as he is at this point, you're like, put your money where your mouth is, Right? Social media is all about talk, 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 talk. Lots of virtue signaling. And one of the things that I was saying with the other elders at the church during 2020 is, I don't care about virtue signaling. I want to be virtue embodying. I want people to come into our church and not be transformed by our opinion, but be transformed by our example. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's do this together. Yes, I'm going to fail. Yes, I'm going to fall short. Yes, I'm going to disappoint. But our God loves us, forgives us, and walks with us. Come on up. Loving in deed and in truth. And this requires relationship. You have to be close enough to know what people need. It's interesting. I remember my grandmother, who I love dearly, <laughs> who I love dearly, so I was debating if I should use this as an example. 
Um, but each Christmas, she would, because uh, she lived over on the East Coast and we were over on the West Coast, she had no, we very rarely saw each other. So she really kind of had no idea what we were interested in or passionate about, right? So she would go to the toy store when there used to be such a thing. And uh, she would go into, for instance, for me, she'd go into, you know, the, the boys' toy aisle and there'd be some random kid there and she'd be like, hey, what, what's, what's a cool toy? What are you interested in, right? I would get the most bizarre Christmas gifts. They were always so random, right? One, you know, I, I, I could go on and on. But the, but the truth is, unfortunately, because of the distance, um, she didn't know me. And so each of these gifts was typically very, very, very random. We have to know people. We have to be close enough not to just love. Oh, sure, I love, I, you know, I'm very loving, and I believe in Jesus, and I'm a Christian. Okay, put your money where your mouth is. Who are you loving? Who are you connected to? Who are you serving? And so there's one last section here. And what John is doing is the whole book is, is to give Christians assurance to know that you know God. And here's what he's saying. When you love others, there's something that happens in us. There are three privileges that we receive in loving others. There is assurance, answered prayer, and abiding in Christ. You could say it this way. We get restful hearts, folded hands, and satisfied souls. First, restful heart, or excuse me, assurance. It says this in verse 19. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. We should reassure our hearts. Some of you this morning, your heart needs to be soothed. Heck, your heart needs to be tranquilized. You need comfort and assurance. You need to remember that you have peace with God. Romans 5, having been justified by God, we have peace with him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, verse 20, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Some of you are struggling with a really tender, condemning heart. You're saying things to yourself. God could never love me. He couldn't forgive my sins. He couldn't walk with me in my addictions. I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've failed him too greatly. When your hearts condemn you, God is greater than your heart. I remember we uh, led a college group at one point. There was a young lady who got in a terrible car accident, and she came to our group, and we were praying with her, and she was sharing what happened. And I'll always remember this story because of how emphatic she was about this. But she kept saying, God, she kept repeating, God is punishing me. God allowed this to happen, and he's punishing me because of the things I've done. And I want to tell you this. If you feel this way or you know those who struggle with this, God never punishes his children. He may discipline them. He may correct them. And it may hurt sometimes. But he never punishes. And you know why? Jesus took our punishment. God doesn't need a double payment. God's heart to us is love, like a good father, blessing, correction, and gentleness. Stop beating yourself up because Jesus has already taken the beating for you. And some of you need to accept his grace. Some of you need to receive this for the first time. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote, I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is almost like setting up ourselves as higher than God. If God forgives you, will you forgive yourself? Scripture says this, God knows everything. And you might read that and be like, either that's a great comfort or a terror. He knows everything? Like everything, everything? Yes, he knows your motivations. He knows your reasons. He knows your ambitions. He knows your affections. He knows what you do in the dark. He knows what you do when nobody's around. He knows what you do, uh, your motivations for what you do when everybody's around. And here's the truth. He loves and forgives you anyways. God is greater than your heart. He is more merciful and patient than we can possibly imagine. And this love needs to, must banish our insecurities. When my girls were younger, they loved climbing trees. And one of the funny things was that as they were climbing, they, had, they, they loved to climb up. They had trouble getting down, right? And so we had to work on this. And one of the things I can still remember till this day is they would get like a foot away, right? And they'd be just in this weird position where they couldn't look down. And then they'd just start freaking out and be like, ah, 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 Dad, I'm not going to make it. And I'm like, sweetheart, you are a foot away from the ground. You're a tall girl. 
you can just jump down and you're totally fine. I love you, I'm right here, and guess what? I'm actually not going to help because I need you to grow in confidence and I want you to get stronger. You can do this. You can do this. Have assurance. Your heart is like my girls when they're up on that tree. You don't know the mercy and love of God. If he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Don't be sitting there beating yourself up, questioning everything when God has spoken. Thus saith the Lord. So you can have assurance. You can also know that as you begin to love others, one of the privileges is that God looks, sees, and answers prayers. I love this. Watch this. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. When we believe him that we're forgiven, that we're loved, that we're his child, we have confidence before him. What does this confidence do? And whatever we ask from him, uh, because we keep his command, or, or sorry, rather, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what he says. Now, if you're thinking, <clears throat> as I know I did the first time, wait a minute, so if I'm good enough, God will give me whatever I want? Sweet! I'll take a mansion and a private airplane and a billionaire rocket trip to space with Jeff Bezos. Thank you very much, Lord. And uh, <laughs> I think a better way of thinking of this passage is um, I used to uh, work down at a mega church down in the Portland area. We had an executive pastor that handled the finances. His name was Char or Charlie Friesen. Great guy, great guy. And um, I did, uh, when I started there, I, I did like our college age ministry at the church. So I would go up to uh, Charlie and I would say things because he was in control of the budget. I would say things like, hey, Charlie, uh, can we get money to provide uh, food for the college group as we get together? And he'd be like, sure, sure. That's what that group's for. And I'd go up to him and be like, hey, can we use the main stage for our college group on Tuesday night so we can do this worship night? And he's like, sure. I'd say, hey, can we uh, borrow the church's baptismal so we can baptize someone? He's like, absolutely. Right? He was generous where he could be to accomplish the mission that we were on. Now, if I would have gone up to him and just said, mm, uh, hey, Charlie, can I get a fancy gold watch because it makes me feel really confident and important, he would be like, no, you can, I'm not going to use our resources in that way. That doesn't accomplish the mission. That doesn't help anyone that only fans your pride into flame. What Grandpa Pastor John is saying is, beloved, because you are habitually obedient, because you can look at your life, not that you don't sin, not that you're perfect, but the direction of your life, you can look and see, this is how I'm loving people. This is how God has changed me. Beloved, because you love, God will uniquely answer prayers. Now, I've got to be real careful here because you're saying, again, it feels like, well, wait a minute, if I'm good enough, then he answers prayers. What's interesting is that there's, we gotta, we got to look at this text. There are some prerequisites in our prayer. First, we should have no unconfessed sin. Look at the scripture. It says, if our heart does not condemn us. And so what I want for us every Sunday when we partake in communion is that you would take some time to confess sins. If there's something that your heart is condemning you for, get honest with God and give that to him. King David in the Psalms says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. There's a great uh, story about a middle school boy who was given a packet of uh, cigarettes by his buddies. And so he was so excited because he wanted to smoke. He wanted to feel so cool and grown up. So he went outside his home after school uh, towards the evening around dinner time, And he went out. They had a backyard. And so he lit up one of the cigarettes and he started smoking it and thought it was really gross. But man, felt so grown up. When all of a sudden he hears his dad calling him in for dinner. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. So he's trying to put out the cigarette. And all of a sudden he turns around and there is his dad. And he's got a smoking cigarette behind him. And you can smell the smoke all over him. And uh, the, boy, <laughs> the boy says, hey, dad, is it okay if I hang out in the backyard for a couple more minutes and then I'll be right in for dinner? And the dad says, Never make a petition while at the same time holding a smoldering disobedience. And so what I want for us, not that God doesn't love us and won't forgive us. You are in family relationship with him, and that can't change because of what Jesus has done. But we want to be in fellowship, in good standing. I don't want to say, hey, Jesus, you died for my sins. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to grieve the heart of God. No, I want to 
honor the heart of God because of what Jesus has done. So we want to, we want to, we want to have uh, confessed all our sins. We also want to be obedient to God. It says in the scripture, because we keep his commandments, because we keep his commandments. When you go to prayer, Peter even wrote this. He said, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to her. And then dot, 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 for the sake of your prayers. That means, gentlemen, those of you who are married, when you go to God, God is immediately looking, evidently, based on the scripture, at your relationship with his daughter. Are you honoring her? And if you are, he listens. And then the final one, that we don't act selfishly. Notice that says, keep his commandments and do what pleases him. James 4.3 says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. So one of the ways that we begin, when we love one another, we begin to see needs and our prayers begin to change. Suddenly it's less about us and all the things we need and it's more about others and what you're begging God to do for them. And your prayers get shaped from selfishness to selflessness. And they start being so me-focused and they become others-focused. And God is so gracious to listen and to answer. And it leads to our final thing, that we abide in him. We have a satisfied soul. Verse 23, it says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and we love one another just as he commanded us. That's the command. That's our marching orders. That is our duty. Communion with God, relationship with God is enhanced, is blessed when we obey him and we love others. In verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. If you feel like you're not close to God, what past, Grandpa Pastor John is saying is, are you listening to him? Are you honoring him? Are you doing what he says? And if you fall short, as we all do, as we all do, that's the beauty of grace, that we can be forgiven and cleansed and restored. So we don't run from God, we run to him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. And so I want to close our time in reflection. I want us to, um, I'm going to invite uh, Jason up um, to lead us in worship. We're going to do things a little bit different this Sunday what I'd like us to do, I usually just have a quiet time of reflection. I'd actually like us, as we prepare for communion, remembering Christ's sacrifice in our place for our sins, as we prepare for it, I'd like us to sing the song together. I'd like us to remember what Jesus has done to secure our position as children of God and to exemplify what it means to love. As we receive love, so then we will love. So let's prepare our hearts by singing together. Time can fail. 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid in Christ on high with Christ my Savior and Christ my Savior and my God. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and part. Done me to look on him and pardon me. Let us receive the Lord's Supper together. We enter this time um, not because we are worthy but because we are repentant, not because we are perfect, but because we know our need. Scripture says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was to be betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us proclaim his death in our place for our sins. Brothers and sisters, as we have remembered Jesus' sacrifice in our place for our sins, our hope and prayer is that you have experienced God's love again. We behold, and then we extend that love to others. And so we want to conclude our time this morning by singing, remembering, and rejoicing in God's love for us. When you're ready, please stand and sing with us to the Lord. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great Thank you. 
is for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus, who demonstrated love for us on the cross. While we were yet sinners, he died for each and every one of the sins that we've committed and that we will commit. He cleansed us, and you adopted us into your family. What love we have received. Lord, may we extend that love. May we extend that love to those who are being unlovable when we don't feel like it, when every other reason would say no. Help us to be like Jesus, forgiving, loving, patient, and merciful. We can only do this by the power of your spirit that abides in us. Help us to be your people, receiving love, and extending it to others this week. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Have a wonderful week, church family. God bless you.